Welcome to Hockey Talk, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome if you're a St. Louis fan. Welcome if you're cheering for the Boston Bruins. And welcome if you're just plain crying because the Leafs have been out since the first round. We've got another great show lined up for you. In the second half, we're talking to Ryan Drury about all the big changes in the OHA. Oh, I should also mention, I'm Andy Clark. Beside me here is Paul Hillier. Behind the scenes pulling the switches are Autumn Oliveira. And we have another great guest in studio with us here. He's been a provincial champion, not just in one province, but in two provinces. We have with us here, Jake Lee. Thanks for being here, Jake. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Awesome. Owen Sound native, got to get that in there. Now, before we dive in and start talking a lot more about uh, Jake's great hockey career, where he's going, where he's been, uh, we should also clear up a little bit about who Jake Lee is not. Uh, <laughs> So first of all, the world of hockey, uh, Jake Lee's a name kind of like Andy Clark. It's pretty common. There's a lot of people wearing that name out there. And uh, there's another prominent hockey player out in Seattle for the Seattle Thunderbirds. Yeah. There's a Jake Lee there. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so he's not the defenseman for the Seattle Thunderbirds. And uh, if you're an aging headbanger like myself, uh, you might also, what do you think of Jake Lee? You also think of Ozzy Osbourne's <laughs> guitarist. <laughs> so yeah, just, when you're tuning in, uh, don't expect to see, uh, you know, heavy metal guitarist here with us. What we have is a great young hockey player. <laughs> so. and, I we were, and I thought we were going to be doing a rock hockey show. You know? <laughs> rock and roll hockey, nice. So yeah, um, so Jake, uh, what you are, uh, prominent, you have a great resume going, but the most recent is with the Brooks Bandits from out in Alberta. You guys won a national Junior A championship this year. That must be really cool. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been pretty lucky the past few years to uh, be on some great teams. Um, back in Listowel too, and uh, in Brooks, it was a, it was a great team. Um, top to bottom, it was a very deep lineup. Uh, lots of guys committed to uh, different schools around the states. Um, so every, every, every practice, every workout, it's competition. We're all making each other better. So that was, uh, it was quite the experience back there. So, through your lineup, uh, ballpark, how many, how many kids would you say are heading off to uh, Division One NCAA schools in the next few years? I think we were up to uh, 16. 16, oh, yep. wow. And the, the ones that weren't were uh, young guys that I'm sure will. Still on the horizon. Yeah. Yeah. So the Brooks Bandits definitely uh, are starting to make a name for themselves as a provincial junior A team in Alberta last two years they've had first round draft picks in the nhl draft yeah it's uh it's a quite a league um this year we had uh um a great player uh luke bast uh he's committed to north dakota who's uh he's a young player he's definitely getting watched uh by nhl scouts a lot of eyes on him yeah. a lot of eyes um and then aw away from brooks we had uh dylan holloway who's cj hl player of the year and he's uh his draft year's next year and uh, so scouts will be all over him. There's, there's tons of young talent. Tons of young talent, yeah. Last year, uh, the fourth, ov fourth overall pick was uh, Kale McCarr, mm -hmm. who uh, we uh, Adam behind the scenes there is a huge Colorado fan. <laughs> so that's why uh, we got to put the shed out for Colorado. So yeah, he was the fourth overall pick uh, by Colorado. And then uh, 2017 had another defenseman go in the first round to the Ottawa. Senators there, Jacob Bernard Docker. So yeah, we had uh, uh, Kale's brother was uh, on our team this year. He's a great player too, um, but it was pretty cool to see Kale uh, uh, in the last tournament, the national tournament, walking around the room. We saw him. There's a huge ovation for him. Mm -hmm. So uh, some great support in Brooks yeah. for him and, and Brooks. So yeah, Kale uh, making his NHL debut during the playoffs. Yeah and playing quite well actually playing a lot of minutes and scored his first game of the year so yeah. that's uh that's pretty rem <laughs> memorable for him and certainly for uh yeah a room of young guys like yourselves it must have been pretty uh, kind of inspirational too eh? oh absolutely um i know uh his brother we, we were actually playing a game um and uh, i remember his, his brother found out that he scored and he uh he was, he was pretty pumped a couple of tears of happiness for him it's uh it's quite a moment yeah, family. works towards it for so long and stuff, yeah. Now, talking uh, more about Brooks Bandits uh, this year, it says here your program uh, 
they've had 87 players drafted directly. Oh, sorry, that's the whole actually uh, Alberta Junior Hockey League. They've had 87 players drafted directly into the NHL. But your team specifically this year, you guys had a 33 game win streak. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was something else. Um, we just got hot. I mean, there's we we, uh, we didn't think about anything that the street the streaks on. We got a big streak. We weren't thinking about anything like that. We're our mindset is just getting better every day. We're, our mindset right from the start was um, the National Junior A Championship. We that was our goal right from the start. It wasn't a 33 game winning streak, right? That's not going to win you anything. So we just kept playing, and uh, it turned into something pretty cool. Um, undefeated at home too, which is uh, a pretty cool uh, stat. So, the, yeah, the season was was uh, fantastic and great way to finish it off too. So uh, undefeated at home. Tell us a little bit about uh, Brooks, Alberta. It's quite the town. It's a uh, little town. I'd say a lot like uh, Hanover or, or One Sound or something like that. It's it's tight, tight knit. Love their hockey. Um, we got some great fans out there every game. Um, other than that, it's uh, it's not much. There's yeah. uh, a lot of hockey. Yeah, it's, of it's hockey. geographically, I don't have a good mental map there of like where, how far would it be from uh, Calgary or Edmonton? Or it's about two hours east of Calgary. Okay. Um, so uh, it wasn't too bad. We got to go to the city a couple times and uh, hang out on their off days, but. It was a it was a good little. So you guys community. would be more out in the the flat territory than uh, yep. towards the Rockies then, eh? Yeah, very flat, very yeah. flat. So uh, let's let's take take it back a little bit to your beginning. What got you interested in hockey? At at what age and, and what sparked you to to try to make a career out of hockey? I uh, I'm not sure really. Uh, my dad was always a hockey player. Um, he got me in uh, pretty young. I think. Uh, he, I was about three, and he likes to tell the story of uh, my first few ice times. I really didn't like the game. I was kind of just uh, just goofing off, <laughs> sleeping on the ice, that kind of thing. <laughs> but uh, you're a three. What the yeah, heck? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So uh, I guess uh, uh, near the end, my dad was saying, "Ah, he's too young. Um, not sure this is going to work out quite yet." So he talked to me a little and. Uh, and I did, want, did not want out of the uh, camp. I wanted to keep playing. So as soon as he said, we're going to take you out, wasn't into that. So I, I got right into it and didn't look back. Yeah. Found your focus, yeah. 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 And then I guess, uh, at what point did you, maybe when you started moving up through the ranks, I guess by the mm -hmm. time you went through Bantam and Midget and that kind of thing, where, where, where was your next step from there? And was it, when was the big change in your life that, kept you playing up until this point for, for sure well I'm not sure there was there was one big one um, at every level I was there was always another step that I wanted to get to so when I'm playing Owen Sound Attack with my local buddies I'm thinking about the Highlanders Then Graber's Highlanders I want to play for them someday um, I get to the Graber's Highlanders great organization play with some great friends friends for lifetime but I'm thinking about junior hockey or the OHL didn't get the OHL, so I'm in Junior B in Listowel. I keep looking forward. NCAA uh, um, school maybe be a possibility. Again, it's just just keep looking forward to the next step, trying to get better. Now, uh, I was going to ask that because I knew you played several years in the Grey Bruce Highlanders uh, mm -hmm. system there. Uh, how much of your minor hockey did you play in Owen Sound? Um, so I guess. Uh, from the start till, I think, minor peewee was my first year at Grey Bruce. So then I played five years in Grey Bruce, and uh, that, was, that was quite the time. I had a great time. Great group of friends there, great group. Um, we never really had a, a great success till the last year. Uh, we had struggled early, but had a great time. Love yeah. the game. Uh, some familiar faces there uh, to me yeah. there. I see a Noah Solinger there. Yep. Who, yep. Uh, he, uh, is playing with uh, St. Catharines Falcons, or at least he, I know he did last year, Junior B in mm -hmm. St. Catharines, and uh, I'm not sure if he's back there this upcoming season or not. Uh, yeah, I think he is. He, yeah. uh, going back to school, um, I don't know for sure. Um, another name, Ryan Winters. He was, uh, he was in the States this year in New Jersey, okay. playing, uh, playing in the NHL. Oh, so, yeah. the, an, it's kind of an American junior, the yeah. NHL yeah. for, yeah. So he really enjoyed that. Um, 
And yeah, then, uh, Brendan come, Clayton there. Yeah, of, uh, good Lestal Cyclone boy. Yeah, and he's a Hanover native, so got to put yeah. that shout out since we're uh, taping here in Hanover. Yeah. yeah, and Danny Skinner too. He played a couple of years with me uh, in Listowel, won the Southern Cup with us. So, Yeah, he, uh, I believe, played with uh, King Carden Bulldogs a bit at yeah. one point. Yeah, yeah. had a sure. brother, Ethan. Yeah, Ethan Skinner was a pretty good player for uh, Elmira. Yeah, he was he was a great player. Junior Tough to beat. beat. <laughs> yeah, put up some uh, really big numbers. Yeah, so that's not a bad little cohort. And I think probably for you personally, uh, a highlight that year is you ended up uh, playing on the in, sorry the OHL Gold Cup. Yeah, that was a pretty cool experience um, because uh, I was kind of a later round guy in that draft. Um, but some of the players that I was playing with are first rounders mm -hmm. who are, uh, I was playing against some NHL players, um, playing with uh, some lifetime uh, OHL players. Yeah, like so, uh, I'm blanking on a few, but Morgan Frost was someone that was Morgan already Frost, there. Morgan Frost, yeah. yeah. He was a great player. Um, Brady Gilmore played Saginaw for yeah. uh, three years now. Yeah. So. Now, uh, for our viewers at home, if you're not sure what we're talking about with the OHL Gold Cup, um, first, I'll have to mention this because, you know, he would never forgive me if I don't, but in the later half, we have Ryan Drury on, former host of Hockey Talk, who uh, is off doing a lot of uh, other broadcasting cool stuff, but he used to, he used to do the play-by-play -play for the Gold Cup for a lot of years. Oh, yeah. So there's my plug for you, Ryan. I'm off the hook <laughs> now. But the Gold Cup is essentially uh, takes a look at a lot of uh, AAA um, prospects for the Ontario Hockey League yep. and matches them basically into a group of uh, all-star teams mm -hmm. and then has a tournament where they play off for each other. And so uh, you guys ended up winning the, the bronze in that tournament. Yep, yeah. It's also a little bit of a tryout for the U17 Canada team. So there's a lot of Hockey Canada stuff that goes into that. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of competition too. It was competitive. Yeah, when you, as you mentioned the names, just even on your team with Morgan Frost, uh, who, like, he was a 100-point guy this year for yeah. the Sioux Greyhounds again, and, and Brady uh, Gilmore, as you mentioned. Di Pietro in there, Tippett. Michael Di Pietro. Yeah, Owen Tippett. Tippett. Yeah. So now tell me about this, because uh, sometimes Gray Bruce, I know you guys travel all through the province and everywhere, but we're a little bit more sight unseen there. We don't get the eyes on us quite as much. Um, how did you find yourself on the OMHA Team Navy for the Gold Cup? Um, I really, I guess it was really just the draft. Um, oh, so you'd already been drafted? Already been drafted okay. at that point. So they, they, they based that a lot on, uh, on the draft and uh, higher rounds, that type of thing. Um, so I bet you uh, there would be a lot of players that weren't drafted that could have easily been playing in that tournament. But, you know. So uh, 2015, I didn't have a committed to memory, that's why I'm looking. <laughs> 2015, round 11, 214th overall by the Guelph Storm. Mm -hmm. So uh, how much of an experience did you have with Guelph at that time? Um, not much, actually. They were one of the teams that I, I didn't talk to, if I remember correctly. Um, but it was a, a pretty exciting day. Um, I, I remember really trying not to look at the draft throughout the day. Was it, was it online at that point yeah. already, 2015? Yeah. yeah, okay. So I'm, I'm trying to do everything else but to just sit on my computer and look. But uh, yeah, then I, then I get the text or the call, uh, whatever it was, and, and that was uh, just pure excitement and joy. And where, where, did, where did you go from that point then? Like what was your next step? As you were talking about earlier, you went from one mm -hmm. step to another. So after that, then what was your next step that you wanted to, to accomplish? Well, for me, I, I knew I was a later round guy. I knew uh, they always want to take uh, the first, first pick and the second pick usually. Um, but for me, it was kind of, uh, I was going to you know, buy into it. I was going to just train really hard all season, uh, all summer. Probably not make the team my first year, but show up my second year in camp and uh, open some eyes. Uh, so that was my plan. Um, obviously, that didn't work out too well. Um, but at the end of the day, it, it did work out, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Now, I do know when talking to uh, Steve Fitzsimmons, who's one of our regular hosts on here, who does play-by-play -play for the Guelph Storm, he said in the people he's talked to, they, they certainly, uh, there were a number of people in the organization that had some uh, 
they were hoping you'd end up with them type mm -hmm. thing. So now I have to ask you about this because there's a lot of details you have to be careful of if you're a prospect with the OHL, but you're someone who still wants to keep your options open yep. for NCAA, which we'll mm -hmm. talk about later, but you're a commit to Canisius NCAA Division One, but there's very strict rules yep. about how you can interact with the OHL teams. Uh, I can't tell you the details exactly, but I believe it's you're only allowed, is it 48, 48. hours? Yeah, 48 hours. So that gives you a very, very short window to make an impression with the yep. team. Yeah. So when I, when I, my first camp in, uh, in Guelph, I really didn't have any idea uh, much about NCAA. That wasn't a path I really wanted to go on. I, my strict focus was OHL. But that was your goal? Okay. Yeah. So um, after the first camp, I, I, I didn't think I was, didn't really expect to, uh, to make the team. Um, so I got sent home, but uh, my second year, I was, you know, I was ready. I wanted to, I wanted to make the team, uh, make a big impression. So. Uh, I guess uh, after that happened, I was a little bit heartbroken, mm -hmm. um, but I knew there's there's other steps. So once I got into contact with uh, Canisius, um, I had a big decision to make. Obviously, uh, so at the end of the day, I made the. Uh, so were you in contact with Canisius all the way back when you went to your second camp with Guelph, or did that happen no, later? No, that was uh, mid-season after my second camp. Okay. So that would have been. Uh, so that second yeah. camp, if, if I'm hearing you, uh, was it Guelph's decision to send you home? Or? Yeah. yeah. So actually, in a way, then, that really worked out for mm -hmm. you fortuitously that if they had you hang, hang around a bit longer, you wouldn't be eligible for your yeah. scholarship to the NCAA. And actually, it, it works out, too, because uh, um, it really paid off how hard I was working at, at the second camp. Um, I guess uh, the GM of Guelph um, called uh, Canisius and uh, put in a good word for me. Oh wow! So that's something that it was that Hockey's. Um, sorry, oh, off the top of my head, so I didn't yeah, mean to throw you there. I can't remember. George the, Burnett was it? Or? No, it wasn't him. Not okay. Sorry. Um, but yeah, hockey's a small world, right? So he actually put in a pretty good endorsement for you. Yeah. Yeah. And here, uh, tell us about this picture here. Yeah, that was uh, that was my tour um, down in Buffalo and Canisius College. Um, went down there. Not really sure what to expect. Uh, didn't have any friends that were committed to uh, colleges, so uh, I, I wasn't sure what, what to expect there, but it was a great visit. I got to uh, stay in the dorms uh, there with the team. Uh, saw a, a couple practices there. Um, had a great time. It's a great, great facility, great campus, um, right in the middle of a, of a pretty cool city. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we took that picture not really sure uh, why they wanted to take that because they haven't had an offered by then. Oh, they had an offered. So yet. I that was uh, okay. <laughs> okay. okay. That's a, I just assumed yeah. that the offer had been done, right? No. They're sitting down. So so uh, yeah. Then a uh, day later, um, about to leave, and they said, "We're gonna offer you a scholarship, Jake. Um, take some time, uh, not too much time." But mm -hmm. so then there's a, a wild couple of days after that, talking to. Uh, a bunch of different people, family, friends, uh, just people I trust, and uh, it was it was an easy decision. Nice, yeah, it's such a good opportunity. Yeah. Now I wanted to ask you. Uh, last year we had on uh, Braden Rigney, yep. who's a guy with a lot of local roots. Who he went to Canisius himself for yeah. hockey, and I know he coached a lot in the Grey Bruce system. Was he ever one of your coaches along the way, or no? Okay. Uh, no, I don't think he was uh, ever coaching with me. My dad was coaching your most dad was of my your, And that's, that's your dad, the pitcher there. Yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, I, I knew of Braden. Uh, he was playing when I visited there. Oh, okay. Uh, so that, that was, it was pretty cool to see a familiar face. I uh, didn't know, uh, didn't know Ray, Brigney personally, mm -hmm. but I knew of him. So It kind of helps cool. when you know someone who's yeah. from the same neck of the woods. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I noticed uh, I couldn't pull the name out of my hat right now, but with the Brooks Bandits, you were mentioning they have 16 NCAA commits already. Mm -hmm. and I saw there's at least one other that's planning to head down to Canisius. Yeah, Simon, Simon Gravel. Um, he's, uh, he's from Quebec. Okay. So he was a, a rookie like me, first year. Um, did, wasn't committed going into Brooks, but um, Canisius came down to watch a game, and they were, they were blown away by he's got some, some amazing skill. 
Uh, he's a goal scorer, pure goal scorer, and uh, he was a great player for us. He, we uh, wouldn't be able to do it without him, that's for sure. Nice. Goalie for the, I believe the Halifax Mooseheads was a Gravel. Are they related, do you know, or? Um, not sure. I don't think sure. so. I don't think he is. He probably would have brought it up. If yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Canisius also uh, should put in a bit of a plug for uh, starting July, we get back into, we switch over and do baseball talk instead of hockey talk. And we've had several uh, former uh, Canisius, well, we had their head coach on of their yeah. baseball team last year. And we've had yeah. a few uh, former pitchers because they recruit kind of in baseball wise, they recruit pretty heavily in this yeah. part of Ontario. So, yeah. Now I wanted to ask you too, because uh, it's kind of a curious thing that with NCAA commits, it's not just like, you know, commit, go. For some no. people that is the case, but yeah. in some cases like yourself or uh, there was a kid from Flesherton that's playing at Cornell right now, Kyle yeah, Betts. Yeah, Kyle Betts, yeah. So uh, Kyle had played locally Junior B here and then he committed to Cornell, but then he headed out west and played yeah. Junior there for like, I think it was like three years or something like that. Mm -hmm. Like there was a three year window between he made, when he made his commitment and when he started and for yourself, you made your commitment. Was it before? It was before this season, or it was uh, my second year of, uh, of the Listowel Cyclones. With the Listowel Cyclones, so yeah, you're three years out. You made your mm -hmm. commitment to play at Canisius, and if you look at your, you know, elite prospect stats, they already have your line there for 2020, 21. There, yeah. just waiting for Canisius College. But mm -hmm. so, tell me about that. How how does that decision get made? Is, is that like, does the school talk to you and sort of say, here's what we'd like you to do? Or how does that come about? Yeah, it's definitely uh, an investment, um, especially for a team like Canisius, uh, a smaller team. Um, they're investing on players, um, not the, the players that are well known that are going to be a huge impact right away. Um, although they do have players like that. Um, but for me, when I committed, I was not close to uh, being NCAA ready. I was uh, just a small 17-year-old boy, probably about 160 pounds. Um, now I've uh, grown up, I've learned a lot about hockey. Played um, another year in Listowel, and then down in, uh, in Junior A, down in Brooks. Um, that's uh, usually the path that people take. Um, they take, they commit, and then they head out west. A uh, couple great leagues in the AJ and BC, um, and you can develop uh, fantastically there. Mm -hmm. So how how, do, how does the young guy playing for the Listowel Cyclones now? And I mean, like you said, it's a popular way to go. But how do you end up playing for Listowel and then just uproot yourself and head out west? Yeah, like there, there, there's got. I mean, is there are there people from those leagues watching our Junior B? In oh, for C? sure. For sure, there's there's always people. So watching. what was the process for you? Did someone come and approach you to about playing out west, or? Yeah, um, I guess uh, when the Sutherland Cup, um, my coach and my coach in Brooks, uh, Ryan Papagano, he was uh, at the finals and the semifinals. So out of those finals in, in London, there was Jordan Asico, who played for Brooks. Um, and then Bobby Harrison, who played for Caledonia, and Pierce Charlson, who played for Caledonia, and then myself, and then Max Wright, who started in Brooks too. So he was watching uh, all over the Goge, the GOJHL, and he loved it. He loved the talent there. Um, obviously, took five, five guys, six guys, and uh, yeah. yeah. I often wondered that how how guys, you know, 17, 18 years old, can just mm -hmm. leave leave everything behind to head out to a new province yeah. and to start a new venture yeah. but like you said it, it would have been another step to, towards what you were trying to get but yeah. it's still a big step when you're a young guy like that and you know you've probably never been out there before mm -hmm. for most of the guys that go out there and that's that's really can be kind of a scary thing but yeah. uh, I guess when your drive is high it's not yeah. as bad as it seems it right? was it was a big step for Listowel too yeah um, only being an hour and a half hour 20 minutes away um, but it was still away from my home uh, away from my family, living with new guys that yeah. I, I didn't know, didn't know anything about. Mm -hmm. uh, my first year, I lived with three guys, and it, it was it was a crazy time. Yeah, right? throw, out, throw out the names. Who are they? Um, Holden Lansing oh, and Max Coyle. Yeah, yeah. So it was uh, it was it was difficult actually. It was to juggle school, juggle hockey, um, 
new house, new family, really. So, but were you guys building or living? Bachelors? We were building. Yeah, yeah building. So yeah, Holden Lansing, the OHA Junior B Player of the Year, and yeah, very yeah. talented kid. Great, great year. I'm so proud of him. He, uh, that's awesome for him. He's worked five years um, or four years now in, in the GOJHL and been a, a difference maker every year. He'd been hard to play against um, and just a goal scorer, right? He, he scores goals, yeah. <laughs> big goals too. Yeah, I had to start there with uh, Wingham Ironman yep. as a 16 year old and then yep. So when you were talking about going out to BC, or sorry, Alberta, but at the same time, like you mentioned living with Max Coyle. Mm -hmm. So when you played in the National Junior A Championship, Max was actually on the other side of the ice playing for the Prince George Spruce Kings. Yeah. So to get into the National Junior A tournament, we were hosting, so we were already in, but usually um, Alberta and BC have to play a series to see which team gets to go into the tournament. Okay. And so that's the Doyle Cup. The Doyle Cup, Doyle, yeah. yeah. And uh, so we played Max's team, the Prince George Spruce Kings, and it didn't matter. We were both getting into the tournament because we were hosting, but uh, it was still super competitive, obviously. And uh, that was it was quite the time playing against them because playing with them for three years, it's uh, it, it's different. Yeah, there was a, there was a crew went out west this year because uh, there was yourself went to Alberta, Max went to. Um, uh, Prince George, as we said, and by the way, I just realized last night, or I just read last night, he's now a commit to NCAA Division I, uh University of Alabama in Huntsville. Yeah. And yes, there's hockey in, in Alabama. In Huntsville, <laughs> Alabama. <laughs> yeah, that's, I know it's kind of a surprise to some people, but they, uh, WHA had the Birmingham Bulls back there with Paul mm-hmm. Henderson and a, a number of uh, really good players. So there's been a little pocket of interest ever since, and they do have an NCAA Division One team, yeah. uh, so there was Max Brock Bear yep. uh, headed out there after he had a bit of a run with uh, the Windsor Spitfires, yeah. and then uh, he went out west and uh, Mitch Dielstra. That was the one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Another, another kid that uh, he was with uh, the Wingham Ironmen at one point too, Junior C. Yeah, and then List Wool, and then headed out there. It was it, it was great to see uh, the success after we won the Sutherland Cup last year. Uh, you see Mitch Dillstra, Max Coyle, um, Max Wright, a uh, bunch of guys, Holden Lansing even, he's, you know, didn't move on, but he's uh, great awards. Uh, so it, it's pretty cool to, to see everybody having a good time. And Holden was one of those, uh, he, was, he was a draft pick of the Erie Otters. Yeah. And I really, I was surprised that he never caught on there. I know yep. he was a late cut two Close. years in a row there, yep. but I, I think now, of course, you know, Erie had to bring it and some huge names like Strom <laughs> and stuff like that. But I, I really thought Holden was going to crack that line, that lineup. But he certainly has done pretty noteworthy stuff in the meantime. Yeah. Since, so uh, so with Listwell there, you have a Sutherland Cup, which is a provincial championship junior B. Uh, and then you're out provincial junior A in Alberta. How would you say the quality League-wise, obviously Brooks seems to be a pretty stellar team out in Alberta, but league-wise, how would you compare the GOJHL with AJHL? Well, I say it, um, I say it all the time. People out west, they, they don't think Junior B in Ontario is very good because their Junior B is, is, uh, is a lot less. Mm, than their so there's a drop-off. There's okay. a big drop. Um, so, but our Junior B here is a great league. It develops players uh, fantastic. Um, mm-hmm. There's great competition. You look at uh, players that moved up, players uh, from from the OHL that are still playing. Um, so it's a great league. It was it developed me uh, great. But when I moved to Alberta, it was a huge eye opener. It was mm-hmm. uh, it was a it's a great league. Every team is has a has a couple of fantastic players that are going um, Division One in some place. Um, if not, they, they should be. Every night's a, a battle, and even though we, we went on these, these big streaks and had a great record, every, every game could have gone either way. Um, so even now, coming from Alberta, my summer has to change, um, change a lot. My training has to change, my nutrition, um, to get ready for next year, because uh, I know it's 
uh, I, have to be, I have to be more ready than I was last year. And I do, I think that's our next topic is I want to ask you about uh, your training this summer. But as you were talking about the comparison, it sounds like maybe league-wide, um, maybe things are a little more focused out in the Alberta Junior League. But I noticed when a lot of those GOGHL, when you have like the solid players head out there, mm -hmm. they tend to do equally well. Equally yeah. well. I was thinking like a Jamie Huber. Yep. He only went out for a brief window before coming back. Mm -hmm. But like he, he, he's a guy that threw up huge points in the GOJHL and when he was out there he was a point of game guy out there yeah. his entire time before coming yeah. back too so um, so I think it's kind of comparable talent wise maybe in that. Yeah absolutely. Uh, now so yeah getting back to you you're saying you had to bear down uh, being out there serious business so uh, tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about uh, who you're training with and, and how that's looking for the summer. Yeah I, uh, I've trained with my pretty much my whole life with Brad Tiley um, these uh, past two years, I'd say, he's kind of teamed up with Andy Plater, who's a trainer for uh, the Leafs and a couple other teams. Mm -hmm. um, so he, they both know their stuff. Um, I have to uh, pick it up intensity-wise a little bit by myself. Um, but they, they know what they're talking about. It's, uh, it's a great program they have running there in Owen Sound. So what's the focus? Is it um, like lean muscle mass? Is it stamina? Is it quickness? Or is it more of a well-rounded thing or it depends on your uh, on your body type and uh, kind of who you are what sport you're playing why you're training um, but Brad I was talking to Brad yesterday and he was saying think about this and I, I kind of knew this from I've uh, trained there uh, since I was very young um, he said what we do here is we train to be athletic we don't train to be uh, big weight lifters I can lift 250 pounds but can't throw a ball athletic, um, want to be flexible, movement, fast, quick, and then obviously uh, strong. Yeah, I know last night, or last two nights, uh, they, they were featuring a little bit of Ryan O'Reilly's dad, mm -hmm. uh, Brian O'Reilly, who yeah. we've had on our show actually, yeah. because he runs yeah. personal training, elite training for athletes. He's really into like the mental part of it too, but they were showing a lot of pictures of uh, Ryan O'Reilly. And I know in preparing for that interview with his dad, if you if you Google O'Reilly Brothers training, like Cal, mm -hmm. who is in the American Hockey League, yeah. it's insane the level of training they do. But I know what they showed with Ryan O'Reilly is uh, like he was doing like balance beam stuff. Yoga and, stuff, yeah. Yeah, doing a lot of a stretching like on a two inch beam mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So uh, the, he really emphasizes a lot of that balance and stuff like that. Yeah. It's, it's pretty amazing the the extra step you have to take to get up to a level like that, like th those players, they, uh, they're bred differently. They, they just are strictly focused on, uh, on being the best they can be. Uh, they're not thinking about anything else. So I th it was an eye opener for me in junior A. And uh, I've, again, I'm thinking about the next step and it's gonna be an eye opener every step, every level nice. ahead. So, so from going forward from here then, is your future going to be in Alberta? Is that where your your mental state is going to be to, to stay out there and, and make a life or? Uh... Um, I don't know about a life. Um, next year I'm back, um, but I right now I haven't thought too much about you know long term. I'm pretty focused uh, year by year. Mm. So. So it's Brooks, and then you're into Canisius, and then, yep. yeah, yeah, that's gonna be uh, something else too. You know, I went from Lestal, small town. Brooks, small town as well, to a big city in, in Buffalo. So that's uh, it's gonna mm -hmm. be something different. Which uh, I know though, like I remember reading an interview with Scotty Bowman. Uh, mm -hmm. If I don't know if he's still there, but like he had moved back to Buffalo out of all those places he had coached. He would actually yeah. said Buffalo is like a great place. It has it has its fans mm -hmm. that uh, don't just pop over for the wings sure. and the Buffalo Bills <laughs> terrible football. They <laughs> they uh, some people love the city. So yeah. yeah. Well, uh, I think the last thing we need to do too is maybe put a shout out. You said your uh, younger sister's a pretty uh, fantastic rugby player. So yep. Yeah, yeah, she's uh, she's a great rugby player. She's uh, grade eleven now, and they just got put out a uh, tough loss to uh, the number one team in Ontario. Um, but she's she's been loving it. She uh, been working out same same thing as me, same gym. Nice. And uh, she's pretty focused on that. She's and pretty your, cool. And your mom, uh, Audrey, is a pretty good athlete. We're saying she's run in uh, a few Boston marathons. Yep. Yeah, yeah. she has. Um, 
that's uh, that's a pretty cool achievement to run in that marathon. Yeah. So we'll see uh, what my youngest sister has in store. So oh, yeah, how old yeah. she? She's in. Uh, she's 14. 14. Okay. Yeah. So that's awesome. So heading off uh, Brooks Bandits, another year of outstanding hockey in Alberta, and then off to Canisius. Thanks so much for coming on in and talking to us, yeah, and uh, all the it. best moving forward. Thanks uh, again for having yeah. me. Yeah, onwards and upwards. Keep representing Gray County and Owen Sound so well. Appreciate so, it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for coming in. So uh, we're going to take a quick break. On the other side, we're going to be talking to Ryan Drury about all these sweeping changes in the OHA that have recently been announced. And uh, we'll be right back with some more hockey talk. Well, welcome back to Hockey Talk, ladies and gentlemen. Just had a great chat with young Jake Lee of uh, the Alberta Junior Hockey League's Brooks Bandits. Won a provincial championship also in Ontario with uh, Listable Cyclones. And after next season, he's off to NCAA Division I, Canisius. So great young kid. Good interview. Yeah, it was a, it was a great chat. A nice young guy. Seems to have... A all his ducks in a row. He seems to be planning one step ahead at a time and not looking too far into the future like a, a lot of the young guys do today. And, uh, you know, we wish him the best of luck. He seems to be... Yeah, I look forward to following his career as he goes from Gray County down to uh, NCAA and plays there. Yeah, we'll see what happens from there. And uh, next uh, item I'd like to bring up there is, uh, I think Adam's going to fire this up on the screen for us. Uh, if you look at our uh, Twitter account, at HockeyTalk913, uh, you'll notice uh, I mentioned here starting a new segment to mix in along with uh, from the Clark Ives and some of the other stuff we do. Uh, I was thinking, yeah, it would be awesome if you have some young people that are uh, doodling up some really cool hockey art, uh, whether it's pictures, sketches, paintings, whatever, as long as it's artistic, could be sculptures. Uh, if you have a youngster there, uh, just put their name. If you want to put their age, great. Maybe put a hometown so that we can distinguish where they're from, but uh, if you take a picture of that and uh, post it on our Twitter feed, at HockeyTalk913, that would be awesome. And uh, we're on Friday nights at 9 o'clock and Sunday nights at 10. So yeah, your youngster might see their artwork uh, on TV if they want to send that in. So uh, we'll go from there. And the next thing I'd like to bring up is uh, there's been some sweeping changes to the Ontario Hockey Association, the OHA, particularly in the Provincial Junior A and in the Junior C. So uh, we have a familiar face is uh, gonna be coming online here with us, uh, Ryan Drury, former host of uh, Hockey Talk. Now uh, he's a host of uh, MWO Sports, which is on right before us. So if, I've, uh, if you've been stuck on this channel for a while, you gotta see more of this guy. <laughs> so hey, uh, how you doing, Ryan? I'm doing really well, fellas, how are you? Real good. good. To see you, Ryan. Uh, How's things? Things are good, man. It's uh, good to be on with you guys. Uh, it feels like it's been a while since we saw each other over at our friend Steve Fitzsimmons place, but uh, yeah, <laughs> things are good. Very busy. So what, what's, what's been going on in the OHA? That's, uh, what are the big changes? I mean, uh, we've, we've heard little bits and pieces here and there about certain rule changes that needed to be taken place and groups not getting along. Um, what's yeah. your take on the, on, on yeah, the so, OHA? So maybe the starting point is yeah. like, why, why the big changes in the OHA? Uh, well, I guess, I guess to start, I mean, it really all boils down to a lot of the member organizations within the PJHL Junior C, uh, the GOJHL Junior B loop, and of course the OJHL Tier 2 Junior A. Um, who have been operating under their own model for a number of years now. Uh, a lot of the member teams in the, these OHA leagues have felt for a little while like, I don't want to say they've been neglected, but they felt at times that their voice wasn't being heard for what they felt was best for the leagues. And I think really, without getting into too many other you know, outside stories, that's really the the boiling down point of, of what these changes spawned out of. And um, I think that the biggest thing, you know, that and we covered it a little bit on, on a show on MWO, was that the leagues are still going to 
look relatively the same in terms of what fans see in terms of the arena experience and how the teams operate how the schedules put out and everything like that none of that's going to change hockey's still going to be hockey it's more just how the leagues individually operate from a business standpoint they are taking on a far bigger role in that away from the oha however the oha is still going to be you know, there in terms of governance and guidance for the leagues, just the leagues on an individual basis will be handling a lot of their own business going forward. So was part of the issue, was it perhaps like uh, fees, like league fees or things like that, or? I'm sure that that factored in um, and the teams will still be working with the OHA in, uh, you know, the fees capacity in some way. But, yeah, that was part of a sticking point for a number of member organizations that I talked to. Um, you know, we, we reached out to a bunch of different teams within the PJHL. And, of course, the GOJHL got a great relationship with a lot of people involved in those leagues. And, yeah, that was, you know, one of the sticking points that came up for some of them. I think the biggest thing that a lot of them felt was that they didn't think that there was enough immediate reaction to things or questions and concerns that a lot of the teams would have, say, regarding things like suspensions, player registrations, uh, maybe even things down to scheduling, playoff formats. There's been some interesting ideas tossed around um, in that regard as well. And I just think a lot of teams felt like the OHA was not able to or just plain didn't address some of those concerns in, in terms of how the individual leagues uh, all operate on a day-to-day -day basis. So then do, do they lack um, like a, an annual general meeting, like say like the, like the upper leagues, like the NHL, where all the general managers get together, discuss league changes, et cetera, does the OHA not do something like that where all the leagues can get together and go over these things at a, like even once or twice a year? Do you they certainly do, Paul. But I, I think that the biggest thing is that, you know, in those meetings, it's hard for the OHA. I mean, give them their due credit. When you stack up the OJHL, GOJHL and the PGHL, I mean, as well as, uh, you know, the WOAA senior leagues in our area, they're dealing with a lot of member teams. The PGHL alone has 63 teams. They're the biggest league in the world in terms of the size of teams involved in one championship, um, that being the Schmaltz Cup, of course. Mm -hmm. And so I think that the leagues felt that there wasn't enough manpower resources from the OHA's perspective to get everybody's opinion on things. Now, uh, the PGHL held their annual general meeting just two weekends ago, where basically this was you know, made public on Twitter, that the PGHL teams, uh, 55 of the 63 showed up in New Hamburg for their AGM. And they sat down and basically voted unanimously. And I'm told the, the eight member teams that were not there also voiced their favor for doing this. And I use the word split in a very, you know, air quotes type of way because, uh, again, I think people should understand this is not the leagues leaving the OHA. They're still going to be member teams of the OHA. They're not going, you know, rogue, if you will. They're, They're still not becoming uh, the outlaw. Yeah, outlaw. They're yeah. not becoming outlaw leagues is a term exactly. that gets thrown around. They're not exactly. outlaw junior leagues. Any, yeah. No, they're not doing that. They, they are still OHA members. This simply is a situation where uh, the PJHL recently here, we've seen it for a number of years with the OJHL, and, of course, the GOJHL Inc. group, which has had its – back and forth battles uh, with the OHA as well. Um, they are simply saying, we are going to take control of how the league operates on a day-to-day -day basis. And they will be in charge of things like player registration, import rules, uh, which they've changed a lot. Um, just, 
really the business operation of the league is going to change. They're going to try and get more involved in advertising their product in a different way. Um, they're going to get more involved on social media. So I, I don't know what that means yet in terms of, you know, we were throwing ideas out on our show. You know, will they start like a YouTube channel? Um, are they going to build a separate website? We don't know yet, but that's one of the goals as well is the marketing of the product as well was a big concern for teams too. Well, yeah, because a lot of the teams, like, and especially in what they said, that 63-team league or 53-whatever it was, they, they really need to get their own stability, their own name out there. And, I mean, maybe it's going to come down to the point where they're going to have to branch off on their own to, to look after their own selves instead of just having the OHA do it, considering they may not have enough members to keep up with that kind of stuff. So maybe the, the individual leagues are going to have to step up a little more and put some of their own effort into it and it, to get what they want. And that's exactly what the goal is here, Paul. That's exactly what, you know, the thinking was behind hiring a PJHL commissioner. And, uh, of course, people, you know, in your area are going to be very familiar with him. He's Terry Whiteside, who's been yep. involved with the Hanover Barons for a number of years. Prior to that, the Walkerton Hawks, he's coached at numerous levels as well. Um, probably he is probably the one of the Hanover Barons. Uh, he'd be in the argument for one of the, the best Hanover Baron players all yeah. time too. Yeah, he's a very prominent player yeah. way back in the day for the Barons. And I think that that is a big reason also why he was, again, unanimously voted into this new position because Terry has that unique perspective of being an athlete in one of these leagues and being on the business side. And basically, in talking with Terry, his goal is to make sure that all the members of the PJHL feel that they have a competent structure uh, in terms of business, scheduling, and the ability to put good products on the ice, and that they all, as a group of 63 with him at the helm, will have control of that now, uh, separate from the OHA running things. Now, the OHA is still going to um, facilitate things like organizing referees and, and things like that. You're not going to see too much changes in things like scheduling. It's going to be very similar to what we've been used to over the last couple of years when the PGHL was formed. Uh, and the playoff format, uh, there's been some interesting ideas tossed around about maybe down the road making the Schmaltz Cup like a, a Memorial Cup style playoff. They certainly have the amount of teams to do something like that and having like a host city for the entire championship uh i don't know how close they are to investigating that but that's an idea that's been tossed around for example and that's the type of idea i think that a lot of the members of the league felt like you know they weren't being heard when the oha was more hands-on with the operation of the league here's a i want to get into some brass tacks about the changes too i saw this is a time of year when typically we see a fair bit of movement between the Ontario Junior Hockey League, the Tier 2 Junior A, and the GOJHL. Like, there's, there's a level of players that are fairly interchangeable level ability-wise, so you do see a flow back and forth normally between the Junior B and the Tier 2 Junior A. But uh, as the signings are starting to be announced, I did see online social media some people making a comment saying, oh, well, with all these changes, uh, they're saying that the, the OJHL will have to pay a lot lower fees than the GOJHL will be to sign. For Junior B to sign a Junior A player, they're saying it'll be a lot more expensive than a Junior A to sign a Junior B player. And I was like, how, how's that all working out? Is that true and is, how, how's that working out? I'm not sure in terms of what the fee exchange is going to be. That typically, to my knowledge, is negotiated between the two leagues. In terms of player exchanges, I don't know where. So you're not aware of an in inequity that way. No, and you know that's the first I've really heard of that. Okay. And, but to my understanding, the exchange between the two different levels of leagues in terms of player transactions has always been negotiated between those two levels. Um, in terms of player fee changes for the individual leagues. Uh, I don't anticipate that is going to change too much. Uh, at least that was the impression we got in initially talking uh, to Terry. Um, but they have made a number of other changes in terms of player personnel. 
Sure, like let's outline some of those. Well, first of all, the overage rule has changed slightly where, you know, often you would see teams waiting until, you know, November, sometimes even December, approaching that trade deadline in January, where they would wait for a while, sign an overage player, and then he would join up maybe midway through the season and into the playoffs. That no longer is going to be you know, in the team's wheelhouses per se, because the rule now is if you are a player in the league and you're heading into your overage season the following year, you have to declare your intent to play that next season to the league by September 15th, heading into your OA year. Also, you have to have played at least 10 games for a PGHL member team in that previous season. So there's not going to be any more of this, you know, nonsense that a lot of teams have complained about of a team randomly signing a, a former junior A player uh, out of the blue to come and play and stack up a team. We've seen issues with that uh, in recent years. Really, that rules to kind of level the playing field, if you will. So that's a change. The other big change there is... is pardon me, it, on September 30th, if, say, a player declares his intent to play, I, I've, I've notified the league heading into my OEA year by September 15th that I'm going to play again in the PJHL. If by September 30th I have not been signed by my old team, I now become a free agent and can sign with any PJHL team in the entire league, any of the other 62 teams. So that's an interesting wrinkle as well. So that might, you know, open up roster spots for other teams. It might, you know, it might make some teams that have more OAs already a little more leery about holding on to them and giving younger guys an opportunity earlier. Um, but that's a big change to the OA rule. Are they, are junior C teams, are they still limited to one 16 year old? I, I believe that's going to remain the same. You're you're going to have the same amount of APs available, but you can only have one rostered at a time. Um, the other thing I should mention about the OA rule is now that uh, if you have a signed OA player, they're eligible to be traded anywhere in the PGHL now. They, there used to be divisional restrictions. Now, if you're an OA, and uh, I, I know I don't know the exact details on the team you know agreeing to terms with the player because obviously the player you would think would have some say in you know being shipped from mount forest to napanee mm -hmm. but if an agreement can be made players are now able if they're always to be traded throughout the league hmm. so would you say they've opened up uh player movement generally yeah i think so and and the other interesting wrinkle that they've done is they've slightly tweaks the import rule where uh which is a lot more interesting in my opinion because you know the pghl it's junior c hockey and generally we see a lot of guys that eventually move on to junior b and then eventually the ohl i can think of a guy like brock buyer who's been on both of our programs before um doing exactly that he started with the mitchell hawks he went to listowel and then he moved on to windsor so it's a development league and uh, the import rule basically now boils down to this. It used to be that if you were born outside of Ontario, you were considered an import in this league. Now, the rule is if you reside in Canada, not born in, if you currently reside in Canada, anywhere in the country, you do not count as an import player. So that hmm. to me is a lot more significant than the OA rule where now say a guy like Jacob Lee who was just on the program, um, if he was say coming back to this area, he, he spent a year out, out west in Alberta, maybe didn't like it, I don't know how he wouldn't, he won a championship, but let's just say he didn't and he felt like coming back, he would maybe count as an import player under the old rules because he's in Alberta let's just say he was born there, he would count as an import player under the old rules. Now, if he was from Alberta and wanted to come here, he does not count as one of your four import slots, which also remain the same. Teams still have four import slots, but the players that are going to be used in those slots 
are now going to be from, uh, do more American players come up here? Do we maybe potentially see European players come over? Because we all know the PGHL has had that European interleague series tour uh, mm -hmm. with German teams, some Austrian teams. Do maybe one of those guys come over on their tour and think, well, it'd be neat to play in Hanover or King Carden. Now these slots are open to those people because if you live in Canada, <clears throat> even if you're from a different country and you live in Canada, you're not an import player. That's interesting. Uh, I, was, I came across, uh, while I was doing some other research, the, the only thing that would sort of fall into that category was early 90s. There was a guy by the name of Pavel Botin who uh, he actually had been a, a European draft uh, pick by the Kitchener Rangers. Right. Uh, um, right after Radic Bonk, actually. I didn't realize uh, Owen Sound had taken Radic Bonk in the European draft, which I didn't know up until that point because Radic Bonk went on to have a pretty good NHL career, took a he different did. pathway. But this Pavel Botan, he came over and he went to camp with the Rangers, and I think he got cut pretty quickly. So he ended up looking for a hockey home, and then so he ended up playing a good part of a season with the Hanover Barons. And this is a kid that came over from Russia. So I was like, oh wow, like I, I just noticed, I was reading a, an old Hanover Post from way back, and they mentioned they had signed a kid from Newstead and a kid from Russia. And I was like, yeah, you don't see that too often, right? So you think though, possibly, people that are shopping around for hockey opportunities, this allows the window of they could maybe show up and as long as they take residence they can play in our junior leagues a lot easier than they did before yeah certainly and i think that that's part of the goal of the pghl i mean it it uh it's gonna add a new wrinkle to the program i mean if if european players do come over that's going to be very interesting um it's going to you know offer some different looks to certain programs because they're going to offer a different style of hockey um, you know, a lot of those kids over there are very skilled and just, you know, can't cut it at home necessarily, but maybe they can come here to a, a developmental league like the PJHL, and there's certainly going to be more opportunities for stories like that. I don't know how common that'll be right away, but the PJHL now, uh, you know, in creating their, their new manual of operations, which is a 93 page long document. And I, I'm, I'm hoping eventually to get a copy of that from Terry so I can look over it a little bit more. Um, this offers an opportunity for something like that. And I mean, I remember even recently uh, the Waterloo Siskins just won their 12th Sutherland Cup this year uh, with a 16 year old goalie, Matt Onuska. And uh, he was mentioning to me along that run the last time the Siskins won the Cherry Cup prior to this season, they had 16-year-old Leo Lazarev, a Russian kid who went on to play for the Barry Colts, who was residing in Canada, and he counted as an import, though. And, you know, under these new rules in the PJHL, Leo would not count as an import because he was living in the Ottawa area for a year. He was in a minor program in the Ottawa Valley, I believe. And under these new rules, he would not count as an import player. That's uh, fascinating stuff. We're going to see uh, some new look uh, when we get into our Junior C, Junior B, and uh, Provincial Junior A rinks uh, when the season kicks off in the fall. Thanks for talking to us, Ryan Drury. Uh, for Paul Hillier, Adam Oliveira, and myself, Andy Clark, you have been watching Hockey Talk. <laughs>